David, thank you for leading that song. It is a special song, one of my very favorite songs. I learned it as a child, and I've always uh, been uh, inspired when people sing that beautiful song. Where would we be without the grace of Almighty God? You know, we sing about it a lot. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. John, no doubt many, many years ago, would have never ever believed that that song would be sung hundreds of years after he left the scenes of this life. But he did. And I'm so thankful that he wrote that song because it really addresses a subject that should concern each and every one of us tonight. That is the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that song, Amazing Grace, is the international favorite hymn. Not just here in America, but internationally, other countries around the world where Christians gather, that is the song that they like to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I uh, am so thankful that God saves me by his grace. And in the book of Ephesians 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is a gift. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And salvation is a gift of God as well. You know, when Paul addressed the churches of his day, whether it had been that book of Romans or perhaps the letters to the church at Thessalonica, or perhaps letters even to Timothy or to Titus, he would talk about God's amazing grace. And in almost every one of those letters, Paul says, grace and peace be unto you. And in that order, he says it. Because you know what? If you have the grace of God in your life, you have peace. And the Bible says that we're to live peaceably with all men as much as in us is. God's grace, his amazing grace. Think about what he says. For those of us who certainly understand the nature of obedience to God, uh, Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This afternoon, Audrey and I had the opportunity to visit with uh, Jill Brown and her daughter, Lily Brown, and to witness their salvation by grace. They were baptized into Christ, and they are here tonight, and we're so thankful that you are. We really are. And they committed their life to Christ upon making that great confession that Christ has asked us to make. And they were added to the kingdom of God. Can't join the church, but you can be added to the church according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. And when a person makes an acknowledgement of his faith based upon his belief in Christ to be the Son of God, and then he is baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of of sins. You know, someone asked me this morning, they asked the question after my lesson, and I was glad they asked the question. They asked the question, well, if a man is saved by being baptized, what about the thief on the cross? <laughs> and I had the opportunity to talk about the thief because the thief actually was saved by God's good favor as well. I don't know whether he was ever baptized or not, but he lived and died under Old Testament law. Baptism was not required under Old Testament law. We know that John the Baptist was going as a, a forerunner of the coming Savior of the world in whose blood people would be born again, John 3, verse 3 through 5. But Jesus could forgive sin as long as he lived on the earth in any way, form, or fashion that he might choose to desire. But the thief on the cross didn't have to be baptized. Think about it. If Paul is right, and I believe that he is in the book of Romans chapter 6, 
where the Bible says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Nobody could have been certainly the thief, one of them, that lived under Old Testament law. No one under the Old Testament or the thief could have been buried with Christ in baptism because Christ had not been buried. <laughs> but grace, marvelous grace, we often sing. For by grace have you been saved. Amazing thought, isn't it? But I want to talk to you a little bit about the true meaning of grace. Grace is not a license for us to go out and do evil. You know, it was a misunderstanding actually in Rome, and Paul addressed it in that same sixth chapter where he talks about baptism. They had asked the question, can we contend, verse 1, can we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul gives an exclamatory remark here, and he says, God forbid. For how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And notice that the newness of life did not come until after he had been baptized into Christ. Now, when I think about the true meaning of grace, there are a number of things that come to my mind. I think, first of all, about the benefits of grace and the fact that they're always conditional. Have you ever thought about the, the, the conditional promises of Christ? Think about it. The material blessings that we have come to us as a result of asking for them and praying for them. Jesus said that we're to pray for our daily bread in the book of Matthew chapter 6. And in 2 Thessalonians, the Bible says, when man won't work, neither should he eat. Our spiritual blessings come as a result of our being a Christian. For Paul writes that all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus our Lord. A man has to be into Christ to enjoy the, the wonderful blessings that are spiritual. In continuing as a Christian, not only becoming a Christian, we know that our salvation is condi conditional. For in the book of 2 Corinthians 6 and 1, in Galatians chapter 5 and 4, uh, Paul the Apostle writes to the Galatian church and he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should be turned away from the truth and turned unto fables. You cannot leave God. You've got to stay faithful to the Lord, folks. Even the forgiveness of sins, the daily purging of our sin. For John writes in 1 John chapter 1, actually verse 7 through 9, he says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ cleanseth us from all of our sins. Daily cleansing, that's grace. And it's a gift that comes from God as long as we're doing our best to walk in the ways of our God who is in heaven. You see, sometimes we fail to realize, even though grace is conditional, there is an unconditional love that God gives unto us. An unconditional love attempts to make us sinful man feel that he will not have to face the judgment because there are a lot of people that believe that. A lot of people teach that if you're a Christian, you will never go before the judgment. But if that's the case, isn't it interesting that every time the Bible actually addresses the subject of the judgment, he's talking to Christians. Even Jesus in the book of Matthew 25 when he talked about the great white throne judgment and John writes about it in Revelation chapter 20 verse 8 through 11. And when he writes about it, he says, And I saw the great white throne and him that sat upon it from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away and there was found no place for them. And he says, They were judged every man by the word of Jehovah, confirming actually what Jesus taught in the book of Matthew 12 and 48, that he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath the one that judgeth him, and the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. 
when Paul uh, made mention of death and judgment in the book of Hebrews, and by the way, it was written to the Hebrew Christians, chapter 9 and verse 27, it said, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after death, the coming judgment. And so judgment is going to come. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10 and following, he speaks also about the judgment as well, that we must give an account. Jesus told people actually to repent and keep the commandments of God if they wanted to hold on to their eternal life. And it was conditional. And he repeatedly affirmed that there was a standard of holiness tied to inheriting the kingdom of of our Lord in heaven. And I've listed a number of scriptures here. I hope you have time to at least jot some of those down. But they are significant, folks. We must hold on to the grace of God. And by the way, let me mention something. I told you I wanted to help you understand what grace really is. Uh, the grace of God itself is a gift. It is. When you go through the Bible and you find all the people that were really saved by God's grace, even under the Old Testament law, now, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Now, that didn't mean that everybody that saw that grace of God was saved because they saw it or because it appeared to them. But notice what he says. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Now, a lot of people stop right there and say, well, that just shows you, it takes you out of the picture. You don't have to do anything at all. Not so. Look in verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's conditional, isn't it? If we want the grace of God... Uh, to be applied to our life, it has to be that we're living a kind of life that is exemplary of Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen to the rest of this. He says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. The grace of God. In every age of time, number one, people have always been saved in every age by God's grace. Now you may be thinking, where is he going with this? And you may be thinking, how in the world could people under Old Testament law be saved by grace? It does not seem odd, by the way, in light of the fact that salvation is by grace through faith, Ephesians 2 and 8, that the Gospels don't record a single instant where Jesus ever said that a man was saved by grace. Now, we got a lot of denominations that teach today that a person is saved solely by the grace of God, but that's just not true, and I'm not trying to convey that tonight. I'm telling you it is a gift of God, but that grace of God is conditional upon whether or not we are walking in the light. Uh, John 1 and verse 17. Jesus, though, never actually said that a man is saved by grace, nor did the apostles ever quote Jesus saying that a person... Matter of fact, did you know... <laughs> If you were to look at all the scriptures that relate to Jesus and his ministry, he doesn't even mention the word grace. Not once. Isn't that something? But we all understand it because the apostles were inspired of God and what they wrote concerning faith was so significant. Why did Jesus never use the word grace? In Genesis 6 and verse 8, I told you that even under the Old Testament, there were those who applied the grace of God. Did you know the Bible says that Noah found, actually King James Version, I think, says, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And the word favor there is an unmerited favor. He was a preacher of righteousness, and as a result of him preaching righteousness, his family was saved, his sons and their wives were saved 
and Noah's wife. And 2 Peter 1 mentions the fact that eight people were saved. Now notice this, not by grace, but by water, by water. And isn't it interesting also in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 that the Bible says, listen to this now, it talks about those who were saved by water. The like figure where even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you look in the book of Genesis chapter 19, you'll see the story actually about Lot. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. What about Exodus chapter 33 and verse 12? And God said unto Moses, I know thee by name, that thou hast also found grace or favor in my sight. And then in 1 Corinthians 1, 4, if you skip over to the New Testament, Paul says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is, notice this, not work for, but the grace of God that is given you by Jesus Christ. Grace. Have you ever tried to define grace? Most lexicographers say that those who uh, go back to the scripts of the Old Testament and documents that we have actually say that the word grace could be rendered the unmerited favor of God. You know, sometimes the more you try to define grace, the more elusive it really becomes. And it's very difficult sometimes for us to uh, explain what grace really is. But in Psalms 84 and 11, David wrote, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. And the Lord said the same thing in Psalm 121, didn't he? He says, But he will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And you know what? We have a lot of people trying to change truth today. <laughs> but you can't change the truth. But the truth can change you. It can. We have a lot of people that don't believe that Jesus is Lord. Did you see where Kamala Harris the other day said at one of her campaigns? Someone cried out and said, Jesus is Lord. And she said, you know what? You're at the wrong rally. Well, you know what? She'll be standing at the wrong rally one of these days. You can bend it. You can twist it. You can misuse it. You can abuse it. But even God cannot change the truth. You know why I know that's to be true? Because Malachi said of God, I change not. And you read the words of Paul in the book of Hebrews 13 and verse 8 that Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And forever. In every age, David would write, O Lord, you have been our refuge, his grace. In every age of time, the grace by which man has been saved has always been conditional and always will be. For by grace are you saved, notice this, through faith, through faith, and that not of yourselves, through faith. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? In Ephesians 1 and 7, Paul writes and says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. That's what God's grace said. It is God looking down upon us. We are endeavoring to live our lives harmoniously with the teachings of Christ. And when we're walking in the light and we're doing what we ought to be doing, the grace of God is continually cleansing us of all of our sin. It's being removed. The sin stains are gone and the charges are dismissed. As I said this morning, in Acts 15 and verse 11, Luke records these words, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be saved even as others in every age. Thirdly, God has always demanded obedience and that it must come from the heart. It cannot be a superficial kind of obedience. It's not 
like others who said, do I have to go to church? No, you don't have to. Matter of fact, if you didn't really want to be here tonight, chances are your worship's in vain. I probably just busted the bubble of a lot of folk. But I'm telling you the honest to God truth. If you didn't want to be here tonight, you came for the wrong reason. God is not honored by such an attitude. And he said unto me, Paul writes and says, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, what that was really all about was about a thorn in the flesh that he's talking about, a particular uh, problem that he was going through. We don't know what it was. But he prayed about it three times, asking God to remove it. And God says, my grace is sufficient unto you. I told you before, a lot of time God doesn't <laughs> take the problem that we may have in life away from us, but he takes us away from the problem. Paul is asking for the thorn in the flesh to be removed. Notice again in Romans 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Let me tell you why that's such a significant passage of Scripture. And, and he's really going to address this question. It's because a lot of people think that once they get baptized, hey, they got a ticket to glory. That's not what God says. We must live faithful unto him. Revelation 2.10 says, To be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. Now the grace is there, but the way that we have access to it is by our faith, and wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Even in the book of Luke chapter 2, and verse 40, the Bible says of Jesus, and the child grew, and he became strong in the spirit and filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was up on him. You know, I wouldn't want to live without the grace of God. I don't know about you folks. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to stay here without God's grace. Grace, grace, marvelous grace, amazing grace. In every age of time, God has always rewarded the faithful and obedient and punished the unrighteous. And that could be Christians who've lived unfaithful to God. Just as those who are out in the world that have never named the name of Christ as Savior and Lord. But God always rewards the faithful. For Galatians 5 and 4 Paul writes and says to the Galatians, But Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now that tells me all these folks today that say, Well, they're the proponents of grace, grace, grace. You can't fall from grace. Notice what this passage says. That tells me you can fall from grace. And the Bible gives example after example of people who actually fell from grace. Simon, Peter, we could think of many, many others. Well, the grace of God's important, and no one could be saved without it. And it appears to all men. But for us to be saved, it is contingent, as it always has been, upon our accepting the forgiveness of God on his terms. God doesn't forgive us just because we want to be forgiven. We have to conform to his will. And that's what Jesus taught. And that's why we need to think about grace and how we need to understand it even more. By the grace of God, you're alive tonight. You are by the grace of God, you are in this building tonight. By his grace. I hope we'll never, ever forget it. And if you're here tonight and one who's not a Christian or not a child of God, I hope you would obey that gospel just like Jill and Lily did this afternoon. By acknowledging your faith in Christ, repenting of your sin, Confessing the sweet name of Jesus 
and then by being baptized for the remission of your sins. And this message tonight is not just for you, it's for people around our world. It's amazing, isn't it, how many people watch our telecast, either on YouTube or Facebook, thanks to Dwight who puts that on for us, or Give Me the Bible television program, and there are thousands of people that are watching every time I'm speaking from this pulpit. So the message is for all. For the grace of God has appeared to all men. It's appeared to you tonight, and it's up to you to make a choice while we stand and while we sing. <laughs>